The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. This is eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. Now, here's your host, Dr. Dan Sutter. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Medical doctors study human anatomy and threats to our health and well-being, but some ailments have what economists would call publicness to them, meaning that the threats to our health are interrelated, perhaps due to exposure to some common element in the environment or because with like an infectious illness, people will pass it on to each other. Public health mixes social science and with medicine and therefore shares common ground with economics, which is also a social science. Public health came to prominence during the 19th century in helping society understand and control threats to public health like cholera, malaria, and yellow fever. In the 20th century, aided by vaccines, a worldwide public health effort helped eradicate the smallpox. During the, 19th, during, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, many public health experts recommended to governments around the world that they use array, an array of policies called non-pharmaceutical interventions. The rules formulated in the name of public health are imposed on all citizens, meaning that the public field of public health also relates to political economy and how we organize society. What's the proper role of public health in improving the quality of life in a voluntary society? Joining me on eConversations today to discuss these questions is Dr. Phil Magnus of the American Institute for Economic Research. Dr. Magnus has a PhD in public policy from George Mason University and works in economic history and intellectual history. He also co-authored the book, Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Moral Mess of Higher Education, and brings a, a strong interdisciplinary to a, uh, perspective to his research. Welcome back to the show, Phil. Thanks for having me. Well, I wanted to start off today by talking about uh, an example from the history of public health that, that you've uh, shared with uh, some of the researchers at a, a recent uh, a meeting that we had. It's a very uh, a fascinating one from, uh, from England in the 1800s. So tell us a little bit about, uh, about this example. Right, so if we go all the way back to about the 1830s and 40s, one of the great uh, problems that was plaguing health across the world was the outbreak of cholera. And cholera, as we now know, is a disease that's transmitted uh, mainly by uh, getting pathogens in water and water supplies. And it's a very severe disease. It's, it's deadly, in fact, wherever it, uh, it breaks out. But uh, when it burst onto the scene, it, it migrated from Asia into Europe in the, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, people had no idea what it was or how to deal with it. Uh, the medicine just wasn't up to, uh, uh, to stuff. It was basically a novel disease for them. And what they did is they, they attempted to apply the prevailing theories of that era, which asserted that disease spread by what they called miasma. And miasma is basically bad air drifting into the area. They thought that uh, pathogens uh, had some sort of an airborne element to them, but they didn't realize it was germs. They didn't realize it was bacteria or viruses that are transmitting uh, diseases. They thought it was uh, uh, things like bad smells of rot and, uh, and sewage and uh, all the nasty things that, uh, that made 19th century cities a, a pretty terrible place to live uh, if you were in that part of town. Uh, so the idea was that uh, you can treat the disease by cleaning up and dissipating the miasmas. It turns out that through sheer coincidence, uh, sewage also happens to be a, uh, a, a major source of infection and water supplies. So uh, by treating sewage, they were uh, indirectly treating uh, the actual course of, uh, the source of cholera, but they thought it was really the, uh, the, the air quality, the smells that was associated mm -hmm. with it. And what happened is, uh, in London in particular, which really kind of pioneered uh, medical treatment of cholera, uh, they dispatched through the emergence of public health, uh, a, a public board of health that would hire people to basically go around London uh, smelling out, sniffing out places where they thought miasma would be existing, uh, where it was emanating from. So uh, finding the sewage pits and the, uh, the cesspools and open garbage, uh, which yes, again, that does uh, mitigate some of the problems from a public health perspective, but it caused a misdiagnosis of the true source of this disease. Uh, 
Uh, but what happened is over the, the course of the 1830s and 40s, a massive public health bureaucracy emerges behind this miasma theory, and you have inspectors that uh, are employed by the public and are getting paid to go around and seek out the sources of miasma. Well, there's a problem. Turns out miasma is not what spreads cholera. Cholera, as we mentioned, is a, a waterborne illness primarily. It comes from sewage seeping into water supplies and being uh, consumed. Uh, and actually, one of, one of the weird ways is when they started cleaning out the sewers of London, uh, they would flush them into the Thames River. Uh, they were trying to redirect uh, stagnant sewage, which was thought of as the source of miasma, into the river so it would flow out to the sea the problem was the water intake plant was downstream of this. So it's pulling in uh, water that is tainted now with sewage that had been flushed out into the river in the name of public health. Well, in uh, 1854, there was a, a, a scientist, a, a, a medical doctor by the name of John Snow. He's not the Game of Thrones guy. He's the, a, a, a long, long precursor to that. He's a medical doctor. And he comes up with a theory. He says that, uh, you know, this miasma stuff doesn't really seem to be explaining uh, why cholera outbreaks w occur where they do. And he came up with a, uh, an observation. He mapped out the city of London and he noticed that the outbreaks could be placed uh, street by street, block by block, even building by building in proximity around a, a water source. There was a water pump mm -hmm. that uh, this one neighborhood was getting all of its water from. And he noticed something really odd there, uh, that uh, the outbreaks tended to diffuse the further away you got from the water pump so we thought, well, maybe this is a waterborne source and we can test this by deactivating the pump, turning off the pump. So he convinced the city of London to allow him to take the handle off of the pump. Uh, that was no longer accessible as a water supply and lo and behold, cholera went away. He had his proof for his theory. But he spent the next several years fighting against the public health authorities the Board of Health that still clung to miasma theory. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have a, uh, an 1855 report uh, from the Board of Health and further testimony before British Parliament involving Dr. Snow, where he goes through and recounts uh, how they basically tried to sandbag and destroy his theory because it would have meant the very pub obvious public implication that uh, there's no longer a job for all these people that are employed in detecting miasma on the public dime to travel around the city. Now they have a solution. So it's a classic public choice story. It's a classic right. case of the science being wrong. And the si even though the science was wrong and was discovered, uh, the error was discovered, it took almost a decade before Dr. Snow's findings were actually implemented. It took another outbreak of cholera in, in 1866, I believe it was, until someone uh, repeated his experiment and said, lo and behold, my God, that guy was right. We've been wrong for all these years, and how many tens of thousands of people have died because uh, we were following the bureaucracy and not the scientific evidence. Well, that, that example brings up a lot of issues, and a lot of, of, of things. I mean, one is that you, you touch upon uh, public choice and, and bureaucracy, and like once you have an organization with a lot of people working for it, th those bureaucrats are going to want to keep their jobs going. And but I mean, there, there, there's also the very important thing that you mentioned: like, the disco discovering this actual source of, of cholera. I mean, that's uh, discovery is a fundamentally important element of, of economics, science, and, and everything. And, and when I think one of the things that this shows is that. In, when we go into science as a discipline or, or the public health realm or, or the public discourse about all of this stuff, we need to make sure we've got the right kind of uh, conditions to allow discovery in the dissemination of new knowledge, right? That's exactly it. And this has been one of the great tragedies I think we've all seen firsthand over the last year is that scientific dissent has now deprecated. It's now uh, attacked and, and shoved out of the conversation. And this includes everything from scientific dissent on, uh, on the lockdowns, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that were imposed. Uh, it includes scientific dissent even uh, recently. I was just reading today about a case of a, uh, a scientist that spoke out against the CDC's suspension of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And uh, this, you know, we all saw this just over the last couple of weeks. They they temporarily paused the distribution, and this, the scientist had noticed uh, very clearly that the statistical evidence, the risk of the complication, was so small, so minute that uh, the damage that would be done by delaying vaccination uh, far outweighed uh, 
uh, the, uh, the consideration of the risk with proper and due informed consent, which is all that he was urging. And he spoke out publicly against the CDC's decision to suspend it, even though the CDC, like a week later, came around to that exact same position and reinstated the vaccine. Uh, the agency retaliated against him from uh, booting him off of the advisory board that was supposed to uh, review vaccine safety. So uh, th th this notion that scientific dissent uh, is necessary to advance science itself has really been suppressed and attacked for political reasons over the last year, even though we have numerous instances of the CDC and Anthony Fauci and the National Institutes for Health, the World Health Organization, uh, getting it wrong in clear, unambiguous ways and reversing their own positions in clear, unambiguous ways. So the people that are claiming that the science is settled are often uh, uh, the least settled in their own positions of anyone in the public health sphere, and yet they're, they're acting as enforcers of consensus to drive out anything that diverges from their own political views. And, you know, and that's why you know, this whole idea of the discovery, that everything that we think we know about the world we have to first learn about is is, is just is so important to, to keep in mind because like in a world where you have to discover things you, you also can't like blame our experts if they don't know everything it's that's that's just the limits of human knowledge and, and the, the way the process works but uh, you also have to be humble when you're an expert and you think you know it all that that uh, to, to realize and and to recognize the fact that you know, so if you are wrong, there's going to be evidence that starts to show up and people will start, you know, want to speak up and say, this doesn't seem to, you know, your explanation doesn't seem to quite work. You've got to be receptive to that. Right, right. And, and then I guess the other part of it that, that your example shows is that, there, again, with, with cholera and, and, and other illnesses, it's an, there is what economists would call a, a an element of true publicness to this, that uh, illnesses are going to be inter interrelated as, as opposed to it's simply a case if, if a doctor is dealing with a patient who has uh, heart problems, uh, that, that can be done in isolation. The doctor and patient can talk about their condition and what needs to be done. But is, there are some ca cases where th there is this uh, interrelated element, uh, uh, economists might talk about externalities in involved here. Yeah. And sometimes it's going to be more effective to try to address the, that common cause of illness than necessarily try to treat the illnesses when they occur on a one-to-one -one basis, right? That's exactly that's exactly the case. And anything you're dealing with that has transmissibility from human being to other human being, and this is why it, it matters a great deal to figure out the mechanism of transmission. Mm -hmm. This has been one of the, the the big problems with the coronavirus. Is uh, you know, there's been a scientific debate. Is it is it truly airborne? Is it uh, is it something that transmits from surface contact? Is it something that transmits through uh, becoming aerosolized particles? And we didn't know the answer to these questions uh, a little over a year ago when this is a new illness. Uh, we could only have conjecture based on other diseases that kind of operated the same way. So influenza, and then we have the SARS one uh, experience like back in the early 2000s. Uh, that were somewhat similar, but uh, but we didn't know the exact mechanism of, of transmission. So the science has changed quite a bit over the last year, and the only way we were able to uh, to, to get a better idea of this is uh, is, is through that process of, of 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 trial and elimination, through that process of investigation, and. Unfortunately, I think what's happened over the last year is because it's become so politicized, because the agencies that uh, oversee the main research in this, the CDC and the NIH, are part of that politicization, uh, they've really deflected the necessary types of research uh, to improve our knowledge base. And this is where you get the tangible results of, uh, of uh, Fauci flip-flopping on masks like a half mm -hmm. dozen times over the course of the last year. We all remember he went on uh, on national TV and said, don't wear a mask, you don't need it, back in March 2020. And uh, six months later, he's like not only flipping his position, but he's saying uh, uh, that, that it was justified that he lied to the public uh, because he had other motives at play. Uh, that's like the absolute worst thing you can do as a public health official because it breeds mistrust. No. If you are going to, if the, we do recognize this common element, this publicness to, to certain illnesses, then it's also sometimes going to be, as I mentioned, wise to try to take a, a common, what do we call it, a common or collective good or a collective approach to, to trying to deal with illnesses. And so, uh, 
you know, sometimes it's going to be the case. It's, it's easier to drain a swamp or, or spray mosquitoes than to, to try to treat people for malaria after they get malaria. And in some cases, you know, there, there would be things like quarantines of, of people who are sick with a, trans, uh, with a transmittable d disease that all of us, I think, as individuals could look at and say, if it, this is was explained to us, we would be happy to uh, abide by such a constraint. And, and you know, from, from a, uh, a public choice or political economy perspective, you know, there, there's a whole area of, of public choice or, or James Buchanan's work of, of talking about exchanges of constraints. And so this, this is all very relevant for, for public health policies, right? Yeah. Yeah, and th this would be like the, the example of something like Ebola, which is a, a very, very deadly disease. Uh, it transmits through bodily fluids, but uh, contact with bodily fluids puts you at a very, very high risk. And therefore, one of the mechanisms to contain, can contain Ebola is to, uh, to quarantine the affected person. And that's when they put on basically the, the masks and the suits and uh, mm -hmm. uh, biohazard suits when they go in to, to treat them. Uh, and a lot of this was thought uh, to be the case when, when COVID first broke out. And uh, unfortunately, we, we've retained a lot of the same mentalities, but it turns out that uh, the quarantine approach in COVID uh, really hasn't delivered on all the things that it was promised. And in fact, it was uh, spread not only to uh, um, infected persons, uh, it's not just uh, if you contract COVID, you should stay at home for two weeks. Uh, it was imposed on the general population mm -hmm. and imposed in such a way that uh, directly defied uh, the World Health Organization's uh, recommendations for uh, in infectious respiratory pathogens as recently as 2019. They said, do not quarantine for respiratory path pathogens. It doesn't work. Uh, we have evidence going all the way back to uh, the Spanish flu in 1918 that says that mass quarantines are counterproductive at best and can be politically abused at worst. And yet that's exactly what we did, exactly what we continue to do. You know, you know, that gets into the, the, the issue here with a, a number of these policies and non-pharmaceutical interventions that, that were recommended. And, and you touched on this, but the, the, we really didn't have a lot of evidence about the effectiveness of these uh, individual, uh, the individual policies here, or as a group together, how they might interact with each other uh, prior to, to 2020. And like, that's not like, that's, you know, that, that's not opinion. I mean, that's really sort of fact. There was very little evidence, you know, there were very little hard evidence on this, right? That's exactly it. Uh, I mean, the non-pharmaceutical intervention approach, uh, what led to lockdowns and then lesser measures of that. Uh, so so non-treatment approaches to diseases, things that try to disrupt its transmission. Uh, this became a very trendy part of uh, the epidemiology literature in the early to mid 2000s. And that's when computing technology allowed them to start running these simulation models. And the mm -hmm. simulation models are premised upon, well, if we enact a quarantine, we disrupt transmission, and therefore the model runs and it tells us how many lives are saved. Uh, so it's an interesting concept behind it, but the question uh, that also goes into that concept is, are these parameters that are built into the model at the beginning based in science, or are they conjecture? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that for coronavirus and most of what we've seen, a lot of it's just based on pure conjecture. This was the Imperial College model that uh, basically uh, led to lockdowns in the U.S. and the U.K. back in March 20, 2020. It was the most influential of the major models by far. And Imperial College, what they did is they basically just guesstimated what they thought that uh, uh, quarantines or lockdowns would do, ran their models, and they came up with all these projections of how many deaths would occur and how many uh, lives would be saved by the interventions. Uh, they never really tested those mechanisms, and if you're building in your own uh, premise to the model, shocker, you're going to get the results that that premise says. Uh, so that's the that's the problem we've seen. And uh, uh, you know, recently I've been been working on uh, the performance of these models. Like one year out, we can actually look back and see how well they predicted, and the track record is just absolutely atrocious. So I've got Imperial College's model run for uh, about 190 or so different countries they uh, they published the results for and in all but one of the scenarios they way way overshot their projections of how many people would die and how many lives would be saved if they uh, if they went into lockdowns and i think they were only uh, only in the most extreme severe lockdown scenario uh for maybe 20 countries out of almost 200 uh they were even remotely in the ballpark 
and the rest. And we're not just talking uh, off by a couple of dozen. We're talking off by 200, 300 percent in some cases. Mm -hmm. and, and places like Taiwan, which never locked down, they were off by tens of thousands of percentage points in their projections. Uh, so it's just an atrocious performance. And the oddity of this is this is exactly what the World Health Organization warned about in 2019 in their pandemic uh, respiratory virus study. They said the problem with these quarantine or lockdown measures, the non-pharmaceutical interventions of this type, is they've never been subjected to randomized controlled trials. They've never been studied empirically. The evidence behind them is all based on conjecture coming out of models. Yeah. And until we have better evidence, they, the WHO is, is saying, do not use these things. Uh, the, the, the consequences are too dire and the evidence is too weak. Well, lo and behold, a year later, what are we doing? We're mired in using the exact same things that the WHO recommended against only in 2019. But it, there's, there's, there's also another part of this, and that is, as you mentioned, like, at one level, the models assumed they were effective. Of course, they didn't have any evidence to, to go on to, yeah. to, to show that. And you know, the, the randomized control trials in the, the area of health is, are considered the gold standard, but yeah. people hadn't done randomized control trials, but there's a part of it is that it, it was, at some level, it's uh, the public health, is our, our research funding agency's fault that they didn't, they, they, they never asked, they, they never asked for these studies to be done, right? That, that's exactly the case. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at the question of uh, where is public health funded? in the United States, well, a lot of it is following the federal government, the National Institutes for Health, and lo and behold, who's the head of that division of the NIH? It's Anthony Fauci. It's a person that's not only like a, uh, a withdrawn scientific administrator, it's a person that's at the forefront of the political messaging for the pandemic response and has been from, from day one. Uh, you know, to, to use a, an economics analogy, Imagine this, and we see this, unfortunately, to some degree, imagine this as a, a, a Federal Reserve chairman who is both making the decisions on monetary policy as well as research funding and monetary policy on one side, but on the other side is like going to Congress and advocating for uh, changes in the way that uh, uh, the Federal Reserve's powers are, are, uh, are enacted. Uh, so it's someone that's like trying to wear two hats at the same time, one of them political, one of them scientific. and. That's just a formula for really bad decisions being made. I, I you know, I, I think there's also maybe another element of this, and that is like, you know, just in, in my own interactions with uh, people in the public health uh, profession o over the years, they, they seem to have, at some point, gotten to thinking of the health of the public as what they're are really about. And, and so, if you look at a lot of stuff that the CDC has funded o over the years, it really has nothing to do with like the public uh, this publicness element from an economic perspective that that is is uh, particularly uh, relevant for you know transmissible diseases and so i mean you know I, I think a lot of this could be laid on the the feet of the, the cdc because of some of the stuff that they funded as opposed to studying these non-pharmaceutical interventions which you know, I mean, maybe they maybe they, they could have been effective, maybe they weren't. But the problem was we didn't know, and, and, and we didn't know because lot, they yeah. didn't fund the studies, right? Yeah, you know, and a year later, this is what's so atrocious about it. A year later, we still don't have clear studies in those areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at uh, like studies on how effective are lockdowns, uh, the only ones that investigate that uh, they have to rely on natural experiments occurring in the world. Uh, so they have to look at, uh, at countries like Sweden and Taiwan that didn't lock down and compare them to other countries that did. Uh, they have to look at states like Florida that reopened early and states that remained closed like California and compare them uh, to see. So that's starting to produce some evidence that, you know, these things don't work all that well. They don't work as they were claimed. Uh, but there was never a, uh, a mechanism to study, and this is all uh, like the interest in this has all come from outside of what we would call like the mainline NIH funding stream. It's from either dissenting scientists in public health and epidemiology, or it's from people in other fields like economists that work in the public sector mm -hmm. uh, that are investigating these things, uh, myself included. And uh, it, you know, we're, we're doing it from an interest in science. We're doing it from an interest in trying to figure out these basic, basic questions that have just been shoved aside by a lack of interest uh, in the NIH and a lack of interest in the CDC because they both settled in on a political message early on. Right. Uh, they threw themselves in behind the lockdowns and now we have like a path dependency on that that they're afraid to retreat from.
And, you know, I, I just think that, you know, had the CDC focused more on the true publicness, <coughs> the elements of health related to the publicness as opposed to health of the public, you know, then maybe, maybe they could have funded studies on like whether masks, randomized control trials on masks or closing schools or, or closing businesses versus uh, funding studies on, on smoking and vaping and gun violence, <laughs> which, you know, are, are not really uh, this, this from the, or again, from the economic perspective, the, the publicness of, of the health. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're veering way far afield of their scientific competencies when they go into these areas. You know, you mentioned they, 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 the CDC and Fauci just the other day announced that, well, well, gun violence is also a part of public health. I think I'm gonna get into that now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm sitting here saying, you know, this is an area of social scientific, scientific expertise that you, Anthony Fauci, are actually not all that competent about. He's a guy that's trained in, uh, in, uh, in allergens. That's his background. Uh, he's not the type of person that would study uh, uh, how to uh, to measure like the effectiveness of measures that are being implemented before the public. They, he's not someone that really focuses on uh, the incentives and disincentives of government mandates. Uh, he doesn't focus on how well people comply uh, with and follow by uh, public health advice. And that's mm -hmm. been one of his great pitfalls over the last year. Uh, he doesn't, he still a year later doesn't seem to grasp the fact that when he goes on TV and contradicts something he said five days ago or five minutes ago, that seeds mistrust mm -hmm. in his own scientific advice and changes the way people react uh, to, to what he's doing. But an economist would pay attention to that. A political scientist would pay attention to that. Uh, people that work in the softer social sciences understand and examine behavioral responses to, uh, to government directives and laws and policies. Uh, you know, that's, that's our bread and butter. We look at incentive structures. Uh, so it's really dangerous when you have someone that's operating on the supposedly uh, hard science side of public health, venturing into the social sciences and doing so, uh, you know, it's like uh, going bald headed into the wind. We're just going to plow ahead and, uh, and make these, uh, uh, these declarations of, uh, of what the public should be doing and uh, hope to, uh, that, that by sheer will, our edicts will be implemented. And I'm sitting here saying as a social scientist, that's not the, the way things work in any sector of public policy, mm -hmm. let alone your decrees, your edicts. And if you don't pay attention to that, you're going to get bad results. You're going to get uh, policies that backfire. And unfortunately, I think that's what we've seen continuously for the last year. And there's a definite issue here in, in terms of what you say trust, because at, at some level, uh, people are assuming, you know, people, average people may assume that when you say that, you know, do this because it's effective, uh, you, you may not actually know that. And, it, but, and yet, you know, public health officials, because they, they deal in what when turn out to be commands or these exchanges of constraints, you know, at some level, it's people who have some alternative motive or ulterior motive to, to have restrictions placed on people. This is a very effective way to, to try to uh, get get restrictions imposed on people to get or get people to try to follow an edict that they otherwise you know may not care about right right and, and you know we've seen this over and over again I was just looking in horror yesterday so the Washington Post and a few others released a poll about public confidence in the Johnson and Johnson vaccine in the wake of this suspension that we had so two weeks suspension and it dropped from around half of the public was perfectly willing to take this vaccine. Now it's hovering in like the high 20 to low 30% range. Everyone's afraid of it. Uh, all because the CDC played politics rather than looking at scientific evidence. And here you've got Fauci who, you know, I, I believe him when he says he has a genuine concern. He wants people to get vaccinated, but he seems like he's his own worst enemy uh, by touting things that in contradictory positions that undermine the public trust, but do happen to serve us keeping him in front of the cameras, uh, keeping his agency at the center of, uh, of public health decisions. So uh, there's, there's a conflict between Fauci, uh, the, like the media hound, and Fauci, the scientist, and unfortunately he's following the, uh, uh, the, the route that keeps him uh, a media celebrity rather than the route that actually deals with the public health crisis. Uh, ahead of us, and it's starting to show in the uh, the responses that the public is giving to him. Well, definitely true. Well, thanks very much for coming on and talk about this uh, very important, intriguing uh, question. And thanks for you all for joining us. Join us again next time for another e conversations. <laughs>
This has been eConversations, a joint production of Troy Trojan Vision and the Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. 